In part one of my talk, I explained what Ptolemy's epicycle theory was and how it was used to predict the movement of the moon, to predict or explain the movement of the moon. I'm now going to show that you can literally apply Ptolemy's methods to economic data. Now, a basic principle that Leibniz set out was that a scientific law has to be able to perform data compression. It has to have fewer parameters or free variables than the observations it has to account for. And the more data compression you get, the better the scientific law, or the better it's claimed to be called a scientific law. Now, he claimed that given any set of points on a graph, he could come up with a formula for a curve which went through those points. Now, given that he co-invented the calculus at the same time as Newton, the, his ability to do that is plausible. So let's try that with some actual economic data. I've got here data on the world oil market from 2007 to 2016. I'm showing the output in millions of barrels a day and the price per barrel that the stuff sold for. If we ignore the years here, which are not really important, there are 20 figures here, 10 in each column. I can draw this as a scatter plot, the set of dots on graph paper that Leibniz referred to. And it looks random, but you might think, well, there's a sort of a curve for it. But it's not a very smooth curve. I'm going to have to have quite a, a wiggly curve to go through all that. Well, Leibniz said you can come up with an exact formula to go through the points on a curve. And it took me a little while to do it. And I had to write a few lines of code to do the calculations. But using what's now called Fourier series, it was easy to come up with a formula that exactly fits the observed oil prices. So here is the actual oil prices, and this is the law I've derived which explains the oil prices. As you see, it goes exactly through all the, the points. Well, what's the formula? It's a bit complicated. I first define phi to be pi q minus 80 over 10, where q is the quantity along here q minus 80 over 10. Oh, go back. Gone back too far. The formula then is p equals 136 cos 2 plus theta plus 27.6 cos 2 plus 2 theta plus 39.5 cos 2 plus 3 theta, etc. So I end up the 10 cosine curves terms and I exactly fit the data. Very nice. But it's worth thinking of what a cosine actually is. This animation shows how cosines are derived from the rotation of a circle. The, the cosine tells you the horizontal position on the circle you're at. The sine tells you the vertical position on the circle you're at. So we, we, we can record that as a graph and that gives us the familiar sine and cosine curves. Now let's go to the diagram of the lunar orbit according to Ptolemy. You've got one big circle and one small circle. Big circle in blue, small circle in red. There's a movement around this. This one goes round once. This one goes round twice for every time that one goes round. And each of these, if we project it down onto the bottom, gives us a cosine. Now, why are the cosines relevant here and projecting down onto the bottom? Well, if you're observing the planetary system, if you look up in the night sky, you'll see that the planets and the moon and the sun 
are located in what's called the plane of the ecliptic. There, there is a, a sort of line going, imaginary line going through the heavens on which the stars and planets are located. So we, we see an edge-on view of them. And therefore what we're actually seeing is a projection onto a straight line of a circular motion. And we, 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 in the Ptolemaic interpretation, what you're getting is the cosines of the, the positions of, of the circle. Now, if I plot in red the cosine or generated by this one rotating, and in blue the cosine generated by the blue one rotating, and I sum the two of them together, I get this yellow curve which is what, according to Ptolemaic theory, you would see if you looked sideways on at a set of paired rotations like that. And the actual formula for the yellow line is cos theta plus 0 0.2 cos minus 2 theta in this particular case. Now that looks familiar because that is exactly the form of equation that I've used to fit the oil price data. The equation for P as a function of Q is a direct application of the Ptolemaic epicycle method. The first equation defines a quantity in the range between 80 and 100 to be one great rotation of the Ptolemaic circle applied to oil prices, on which I have superimposed nine epicycles, and this then generates the observed prices at the, exactly the right times. How many parameters do I need for this? Well, I've got a general formula, which is a recursive formula, which r applies one after the other. So I don't need to add up the, the, the terms of the formula. Uh, basically, I've got 10 constants, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There are another couple in the definition of theta, so let's say 12 constants, but I put twos in here. Uh, maybe we add one of them. So I've, I've either got 12 or 13 parameters in this formula. The original data had uh, 20 numbers. I've now got uh, 12 numbers plus a few math symbols. So in terms of explicit parameters used, the Ptolemaic theory is pretty efficient at dealing with oil prices here. Is it a law? No, because the, the form is still too long and complicated. It would be foolish to say that that was a, an economic law. It's a joke economic law. It's a joke theory of prices. And it's a joke theory of prices which fits them exactly. It's an example of what in artificial intelligence you call overfitting. You fit your data exactly, but for other periods you almost certainly would get the wrong data. It's unlikely that on years when there were 85 million barrels a day being produced that the price would have been $280. Maybe it would, but we don't have any observations there. Now, I'm going to go from a joke theory of economics, which gives exact exact fits, to the theory of Samuelson. Now, Samuelson is the most prominent American economist who was the first one to win a Nobel Prize, and he was said to have done more than anyone else to raise the level of scientific analysis. Well, why is he famous? Not just that he got the Nobel Prize, but before that he'd written the standard textbook of economics, which millions of students have had to be exposed to. And as such, the presentation of price theory, or value theory, that Samuel Gibson gives, provides part of the intellectual background of almost anyone who has had to do a social science qualification in an American or British university. What's the price theory you get in Samuelson? Well, if you've ever done an economics course, you'll be familiar with this diagram. Price, according to Samuelson, is caused 
when you get an intersection between two curves, the S or supply curve and the D or demand curve. Along the x-axis here, like the one I had for oil, you have the quantity supplied, or the quantity being produced. And the y-axis is the price. And supposedly, there is this S-curve, which is the supply, and the D-curve comes from the consumers, and where the two meet, you get the actual quantity and price that will be supplied. That's the story we're told. Now let's look at this Samuelson story from the standpoint of Leibniz. How much information is required for the curves? Now I've, this is a photograph from his book. Okay, I photographed his book and these are the actual numbers he gives in his book. So I've re-graphed it myself. Now uh, I took the data points and told Knumeric to draw a smooth curve through them. How much information is required for the curves? Well, Gnumeric used a cubic spline to do that. Uh, if I asked Gnumeric to do a second order polynomial regression on it, it fits a polynomial curve of second order, which comes close to, but doesn't go exactly through the points. It doesn't do anything like as well as the Ptolemy theory I gave you before. Uh, and that's because it's only got three parameters here. It doesn't have enough parameters. Here we have one, two, three, four, five data points, and his a three parameter curve isn't going to be enough to fit it. So he has provided data which is at least of third order, possibly fourth order polynomial. So he, he's going to need a formula with at least four constants for each curve. So he's going to have an x cubed turn as well. So there's going to be a constant term, an x term, and an x cubed term. Now, this is gross overkill. He's got two curves with a total of eight parameters to explain two numbers. All he's actually got as an observation is the, the price, the supply price and selling price pair. 12, 12 units supplied at a price of three. So it's a fourfold redundancy. Fourfold, four times as many free parameters as the actual data. If we look at Ptolemy's epicycle theory and compared it with Newton's theory, I said that the Ptolemy theory has a twofold redundancy. It requires you to supply twice as many constants to specify the evolution of the system as a Newtonian mechanics does. Well, is this fair? Well, Ptolemy's epicycle theory is pretty good, and the supply and demand curves are even more imaginary than Ptolemy's epicycles. By successive observations, Ptolemy was able to calculate the parameters of his epicycles. But with Samuelson's curves, the pairs can never actually be measured. The curve pairs can never actually be measured. You can never actually get the parameters of these curves. Why is it impossible to estimate? It's because there are infinitely many pairs of curves you can draw going through this observed quantity 3 and 12. Now Samuelson makes it appear that you've got these extra data points but you can't actually observe those data points. All he actually observes for a given day, a given year is a combination of price and quantity. These are imaginary data points or these are imaginary points. He's just dreamt them up to draw them on our blackboard. The same observed data of 12 and 3 could equally well have been produced by these two curves. Why should it be Samuelson's curves? Why shouldn't it be another two pair of curves? It's not an operational theory. A curve and a corresponding function is only a scientific abstraction. 
if there is some operational procedure for estimating the function. And to do that, you need multiple observations, as many as there are parameters of your curve. So if, you're, if each of your curves is third order, you're going to need at least four parameters to, 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 to fit them. You need, and that means you need four observations on each curve. So you must take four observations on the curve in order to fix it. Now he has fake observations on his diagrams because it's not operational according to Samuelson whenever prices actually change the curves shift. So his theory of changing in prices is that here we have the original supply curve and the supply curve moves to the right and we get a new price or in this case the uh, demand curve moves, sorry, the supply curve moves to the left and the demand curve moves to the right. So these new prices are produced by shifts in the curves. That means you can never get a time series of prices and fit these to the curves. Because for every price change, at least one of the curves is altered. Now, if these are fourth order, uh, third order curves, every time there's a price change, that gives us another four free parameters we're going to fit. Um, now, if we knew that one of the curves had shifted, we knew which one of the curves had shifted, with enough observations, you might be able to get an estimate of the other one. But you don't know which one's shifted. Since both of them might have shifted, we're none the wiser. The worst case is they both shifted and you've got eight new free parameters and one new observation. Here we've got the oil price data. You can invent 20 curves which intersect to give these 10 real points. And nobody can disprove these e curves exist. Samuelson can hypothesize these curves. An economics lecturer can draw these curves on a blackboard. And no one can disprove that these curves exist. But in this sense, the curves, the supply and demand curves, are like in invisible fairies or angels. No one can disprove that there are invisible fairies at the bottom of my garden. I can believe them if I want. No one can disprove their existence. But Positing invisible things that no one can disprove the existence of is hardly science. Compare my joke Ptolemaic theory of the economy. The joke theory required 12 parameters to fit that data and it fitted it exactly. With Samuelson's wandering curve theory I've tried to join up these points with as few curves as possible. Um, so I, I've got one wiggly curve which goes through all this. And three curves, three points are handled by that curve, two points by that curve. But taking into account the, the number of turning points on that curve, I estimate it would still require about 35 parameters here to handle 10 observations or 10 price value pairs that we've observed. So 35 numbers to account for 20 numbers in your data. Is that science? It's just mysticism. It's wizards inscribing pentagrams to, to impress their apprentices, calling up spirits from the misty deep. Some things are just random. The formal definition of random data is any data whose mathematical description is more complex than the data itself. Superstition is based on the idea that there is something, some fairies or spirits behind the occurrence of random events. Economies are stochastic systems. And when you construct theories like neoclassical economics, that give no actual information about what prices are. 
it's just a form of higher superstition. You draw the graphs to fit the data, but you're free to draw any graphs you want. Just as a, a sorcerer is free to attribute your illness to some evil spirit or evil spell. Invisible causes can be invented. Science requires testable, observable functions which can be operationalized and measured.